Hello, and welcome to Read the World. My name is Derek Main, and this is the channel where I review translated literature. And yet, today, I am not going to review any translated literature. <laughs> so, uh, as I mentioned in my video for the President's Room, uh, my most recent review, I'm working through Hurricane Season uh, by I don't have it in front of me. Fernando McCor, translated by Sophie Hughes, the Fitzcarraldo editions. So, I've been working my way through that, but I have found during this extremely weird time for everyone across the world, very difficult to concentrate, um, even on reading, and very difficult to find um, joy in things, because I've been depressed and anxious while also, of course, putting on a very brave face. Um, you know, because I'm a dad, and I have to, I have to soldier on and help folks out, and, uh, and anyway, kind of rambling. But it's been difficult to just like my normal routine, sit down wherever I'm at and focus. But at the same time, I have a really strong desire to make some videos to provide some content um, to interact, you know, and to feel like that connection with other bookish folks and folks on booktube um, because it is meaningful right now, even maybe more so, especially. So I thought I would do something kind of fun, which is just talk very briefly about six of my personal classics of American literature, so no translations. And I think one of them I'm hopeful is actually American and not British. And I am going to do something totally American. Good. Okay. I Googled it very quickly. <laughs> he is was an American novelist. So I've got six here, and I'm just going to tell you what it is I love about them. They are six that are quite different, and I'm not going to do full-length reviews. I'm not going to read from them. Um, this is going to be much more kind of casual. I went through my shelf, and I was like, what are six of my favorites that would be kind of fun to talk about? And what that means is... Like, I'm not going to pick up Pale Fire. Yes, it's one of my favorites. Um, you know, I'm not going to pick up um, Absalom, Absalom. You know, yes, it's one of my favorites. So, you, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, not, but there, are, I think, is, is one fairly big obvious one here. But the rest, I think, are a little quirkier and different. Hopefully, we'll see. So, the first one is going to be Falconer by John Cheever. I'm so used to saying translated by, but <laughs> by John Cheever. And what is, who puts these out? These are all like such big publishers that I don't know what version this is. <laughs> uh, Valentino novel. Uh, so Cheever by John Falcon, or sorry, <laughs> Falconer by John Cheever. Why this is one of my six. I read this book and I remember very, very clearly what headspace I was in, which was I was kind of going through a phase of those 60 white male writers. And in fact, all six of my books from America are white male writers. And I think that's because during the time that I read so much of, of American stuff, I went with what was easy to identify with and what felt, you know, really relatable to me. And, and since, uh, based on this, as you know, from this channel and my taste, my reviews, everything else, I have gone, done a complete 180. And now I look for things um, that are not um, so much like me you know, both physically and, and maybe psychologically. But that's the headspace I was in, and I just love this story of the professor who was locked in jail and how he was able to, in that confined space, um, find some hope for the world and find some contentment 
you know, uh, find some purpose there, you know, amongst the prisoners. And just a great story, a great writer. Love that one. Next up, very famous author, although I feel like this book is not often mentioned in some of his best, this is Thomas Pynchon's Inherent Vice. Ah, uh, Penguin book. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna do the publishers because like it's all gonna be like one of the four big ones or whatever, you know? Right? Oh no, there's one, there's one Dalkey archive, so I'll mention that one. Okay. Thomas Pynchon and Inherent Vice. Here's the reason. So I could have easily uh, pulled down my favorite noir books. I've talked before about noir. Um, I would say prior to getting into translate literature, so I had that area where I was really focused on those 60s white men and that type of sort of suburban modernism, we'll call it. So I had that, and then I went to a big noir phase. I still love noir. I still read a lot of it. Um, and then... Um, on to translate literature where I've been for uh, at least six years now. So, five, six years. So Thomas Pynchon's Inherent Vice is a noir, and in many ways it is an end of an era noir, so the end of the 70s. And uh, most noirs come with one big great overarching theme, and that's what we're going to get here. But the reason this is so much fun is there's just so many Easter eggs and nuggets buried amidst this thing. It's just a really fun read, a great reread. If you've not seen the movie, one of the best book to movie ever. I mean, the movie P.T. Anderson does an incredible job getting the vibe, the color, the feel of this thing as the hippie in surfer town, California, sort of just like floats in and out of the ether of a mystery, surrounded by many of the touchstones of, of noir, but also the touchstones of what we now kind of call late capitalism. We've got developers and we've got the yachtsmen and, of course, crooked cops and just kind of smoking weed their way through this journey, but amidst it is a lot of human connection that is sometimes missing in noir um, that's really beautiful and glorious, and it's actually hopeful, um, which I really like, but a fun, fun read, like great entertainment. In fact, right now, while you're cooped up, this is one I would definitely recommend if you haven't read yet because it's just a hell of a lot of fun. Next up is Larry McMurtry. All my friends are going to be strangers. And Larry McMurtry is obviously much more famous for Lonesome Dove and then The Last Picture Show. I've never read Lonesome Dove. I believe my wife did. I know she watched the miniseries and really liked it. I have read The Last Picture Show, it's very good, so is the, the movie. But All My Friends Are Gonna Be Strangers is one that I actually gravitate to and like the most because it feels a little autobiographical in the sense that it's this kind of young writer who's been maybe tossed out of university or you know, just like things aren't really working his way and then he's gonna go from Texas to California and he's gonna meet older women, he's going to meet some of the hippie scene, you know, there's just like all of these um, shards of life that are happening as he sort of weaves his way through, but at the center are a couple relationships, particularly one with uh, a fellow writer in town that are kind of grounding him. And All My Friends Are Going to Be Strangers, the reason that this sticks with me for so long is it reminds me very clearly of that time when we were, say, 17 to 20, 22, you know, it depends on like, you know, how the course of your life went. But for me, that was that time period where everything is full of possibilities. Everyone you meet um, takes on this immediate, really important meaning because they could be something in your life that you you know, can't even imagine, and because there seems to be a permanence that is happening around you, even while now, with the benefit of age, we realize how temporary all that stuff is, 
And the title actually captures that. All my friends are going to be strangers. All my friends from that era now, for the most part, are strangers. And that's the way that it happens. That's the way life happens. So um, watching it in real time was awesome. Again, as you can see, a lot of these books like relate. The stuff that I liked about uh, so much American fiction was too relatable to me, which is why I switched it over. And so speaking of that, the most relatable on here, and perhaps the most obvious, is ooh, Frederick Exley's A Fan's Notes, Vintage Contemporaries. So this is, I don't know, cult classic, maybe classic, um, and it is... It's beautiful. I love it. So I um, have not uh, drank anything in seven years. Um, this is an alcoholics memoir of going in and out of nut houses and in and out of bars and in and out of people's lives. And it is exquisitely told. He also, the fans notes part is he's a fan of the New York football giants and he's letting that be a, that intense, insane fandom be kind of an anchor that anchors him to some sort of reality as he goes further and further off the deep end and into the unreal. So as someone that certainly did drink a lot, does not anymore, and has uh, dealt with mental health issues and stuff like that. This is one of those classics that we kind of all get handed at one time by a friend, at least here in America, and uh, and is always stuck with me. Speaking of classics, so this is the most obvious whatever classic. I think it might be the best American novel of the past X number of years, and that is Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. This Picador classic has a beautiful cover as you can see. I'm assuming you know exactly what the deal is with this, but to me it has one of the best characters, the judge, that you are ever going to get, this philosopher psychopath, um, and really represents, to me at least, this book represents um, the way in which humans progress through geography to overtake places and call them and name them their own and to overtake people. And so that pioneering spirit, the nice way of putting it, uh, is actually a very dark, evil, and dirty business. And that is what Blood Meridian kind of is to me. It also is a dark, dark philosophy um, on humans, the human condition, and what we are want to do as we try to uh, hoard resources and overtake other peoples that uh, would be short-term or temporarily advantageous for us to rule. Um, and yeah, it's dark. My last one is uh, one of my favorite books of all time. This was the Dalky Archive one. It is the Dalky Archive one. So, Vigastine's Mistress by David Markson, um, an experimental novel like all of his novels, um, but one of those rare avant-garde experimental novels that absolutely works because the ending, well, the premise along with the ending really make this thing a complete story. So there is an entire plot here. There's an entire A, B, and C, but it is not told linearly course, but um, when you finish and it's wrapped up, you kind of realize what it is that you had read and you immediately want to start over. It has one of the best openings ever. In the beginning, sometimes I left messages in the street. That's the first sentence, the first paragraph, and God, that was good. Somebody is living in the Louvre, certain of the messages would say, or in the National Gallery. Naturally, they could only say that when I was in Paris or in London. Somebody is living in the Metropolitan Museum, being what they would say when I was still in New York. Nobody came, of course. Eventually, I stopped leaving the messages. To tell the truth, perhaps I only left three or four messages altogether. I have no idea how long ago it was when I was doing that. If I was forced to guess, I believe I would guess 10 years. 
And of course, I was quite out of my mind for a certain period of time, too, back then. I do not know for how long a period, but for a certain period. This is going to start you on a journey that is going to be very apropos to today's time. Uh, the, our narrator is excelling at social distancing. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this. I thought this would be a fun, quick, like, throw it up there, here's six, don't be too serious about it or anything, kind of stuff I like. Maybe you'd get to know how my reading journey came to where it was, and maybe you'll see some of the faults that I saw in myself as I read through these very similar type of people writing them, you know what I mean? Uh, so the philosophy that you're going to get and the worldview that you're going to get is too limiting. As much as I love all six of these, it's too limiting. You can't just stay in this zone. I know too many readers that do that. And honestly, um, you're missing out. You're missing out. So read the world today. Celebrated six great American books. But it also reminded us why we read the world. Be good to folks.